This is Jason Kingsley, historian, host of Modern History TV, and CEO of the video game studio Rebellion. Today he's joining us to share his thoughts on both the history and designs of a selection of historical video games, including one of Rebellion's own, the Sniper Elite franchise. We've shot Hitler many times in the Sniper Elite series. <laughs> People say, why don't you have somebody else in there? It's Charlie Brooker, by the way. I don't think you noticed that. We scanned Charlie Brooker into the game, and that was Charlie Brooker. Charlie performed excellently as a drunk Nazi, by the way. You can find more about Jason Kingsley and his historical content in the description below, as well as information on his new book, Leading the Rebellion. Right, over to Jason. We've got some uh, Mongol heavy cavalry, which is always interesting to see. Horses are armoured. They were in ancient times, and they're armoured at this period, but they are primarily, or at least initially, going to be using the missile weapons, which is always interesting. This particular character has got a very flexible lower back. He seems to be able to spin around very easily. I suppose if you've trained from childhood, you'd, you'd be that good. You'll notice he's not riding with any reins. We don't quite know uh, how this was done, and it might be that the Mongols were very carefully trained their horses to take leg, con leg commands and weight commands, which you can do. The trouble with shooting a bow from horseback is you get an equal and opposite reaction. I've tried it with a longbow. Standing on a horse, shooting a longbow is very difficult, not because of the longbow itself, but because the reactive force pushes you backwards. So when you're on a horse, there's gonna be a force pushing in the opposite direction to the arrow, but the techniques are exactly right here. What they're doing is they're taking the foot out from a distance, they're going around the foot because the foot have got shields on one side. Obviously, if you shoot a footman um, infantry from behind, they don't even know there's an arrow coming. They don't have a shield. And you're shooting against a mass of men as well. You're shooting against a sort of horde of close packed infantry, which means you don't have to single out an individual target. You can just shoot at that horde of men and something will hit probably. And they can't get you, more importantly, because you just gallop away. We do have records from the Crusades of people talking about how many arrows stuck in their horses, but it survived. There's one in particular, a French knight, came back and he had nine arrows stuck in him and 12 stuck in his horse. But he was alive and they were alive. The armour was so good that it prevented both of them from dying. The horse was injured and had to be you know, looked after but didn't actually suffer from any ill effects after they'd recovered. And like in the movies, armour <laughs> is supposed to protect you and it does the job. It usually does the job very well. Now, just as a little bit of foot combat there, using a sword from horseback is quite tricky. You have to get it right. One of the things that people who are used to using a sword on foot easily forget is that in the middle of you, you have a horse and a horse's head, your horse, your horse's head. You cannot swing through the horse's head more than once. And if you do, the horse dies and you fall to the ground and you're probably trampled by your fellow knights or fellow Mongol soldiers. So you have to use shots either side, and there's a, there's a forehand and a backhand shot on both sides. But of course, if you are typically right-handed, you've got a greater reach on the right-hand side, or what we call the off side of the horse, the off-hand side of the horse. Most combat, if you can, you try and get the enemy like between 12 o'clock and three o'clock, that's gonna be your strongest attack. And obviously you, you, you hit and you move, you don't stand still. And again, unlike the movies, you don't wanna just sit on your horse and, and slash around you. You're gonna get taken out by pole arms, people from behind are gonna stab you, whatever it might be. You need to use the speed of the horse and the weight of the horse to get out of trouble. So you hit and leave. Now we've got the siege equipment coming in. And one of the problems with siege equipment is it's incredibly heavy, it's very slow moving and very vulnerable. So I am never sure how effective these kind of battering rams actually were or how many men you would lose. You're gonna lose a lot more men than the, than the defenders. In this bit, it looks like they, they've smashed down the door. So, you know, arguably there's an awful lot of attackers compared to the defenders. Um, and they're using what used to be thought of as murder holes. And I think they've got dual purposes. In Often in gatehouses, we see holes in the ceiling. I also think that those holes are more to do with putting out fires. Because if you think about really thick wooden gates, they're gonna be incredibly hard to batter down. The best thing you can do is actually to build a fire against them and burn them down or at least weaken them and if you can soak the timbers or chuck water on them that's going to stop them burning you know how difficult it is to, to set fire to soggy wood so i think they probably had multiple purposes it's just useful to be able to chuck things on people usually stones and logs or whatever you've got but also for uh, for, for for wetting down the, the fire 
a lot of defense is about slowing the enemy down. It's not actually about stopping them. There's very few defensive techniques that can just stop people. Even these days, defenses can be broken with time. Once they're breaching the walls like this, um, you're, in, you're in difficulty because then it comes down to a slogging match. Mountain Blades, absolutely fantastic game. I really like it because it gives people that can't ride an opportunity to sort of experience cavalry combat. But something like Mountain Blade is, is brilliant because it does, it, it helps people understand some of the tactics, the theoretical tactics of uh, cavalry combat for somebody that doesn't want to spend hours in a riding school learning to walk, trot and canter. So here we are in one of my games. <laughs> For those that don't know, I do the medieval stuff, but I also make games. A company called Rebellion is, is mine, and um, I'm the creative director and CEO of it. One of the things with Sniper Elite is that it's always about the secret war behind the scenes. And here we have something that was conceived of in World War II, the rat tank, this giant, giant sort of uber tank, super tank. There wasn't ever historically a real one, but we decided in Sniper Elite that there should be. And uh, these are the results. This is what you can do in the game. The vulnerability of the rat tank was, of course, it was immensely big and immensely slow. It had big guns, sure, and it had big armor, but it was still gonna be taken out by bombs from Mustangs, for example. Those bombs would have taken out the rat tank and it wasn't gonna be able to hide. It was more of a propaganda weapon. Taking it out would have been a great propaganda victory because we would have talked about we've destroyed their super weapon, even though it being there or not being there probably wouldn't have made that much difference in the real war itself. People expect explosions to sort of look a certain way. I remember having discussions about should we make the explosions like they really are, high explosive. It doesn't really have much in the way of flame, it just destroys everything in a certain area instantly. And we played around with it and we felt that for entertainment purposes we're better off sticking with the with the slow burn effect, with the visual effect that everybody expects. I kind of regret that in a way, because it would have been quite fun and interesting to see a proper high explosive, you know, fast explosion happening without the, without the bits in it. But we made that decision at the time to meet people's expectations. So it's, it's one of the historical compromises you have to make. And here we have the big bad. We've uh, shot Hitler many times in the Sniper Elite series. <laughs> <laughs> Shot him a lot. People say, why don't you have somebody else in there? It's Charlie Brooker, by the way. I don't know if you noticed that. We scanned Charlie Brooker into the game, and that was Charlie Brooker. Charlie performed excellently as a drunk Nazi, by the way, if anybody's interested. He uh, he excelled in the motion capture for that. Here's Hitler in his famous white outfit, and he did historically wear the white outfit. Now, in this game, we play around with the idea of doubles. Hitler was known to have multiple doubles, and Hitler has certain physical features, one testicle, allegedly, but also was right-handed or left handed. Single testicle in this case would indicate it was the Fuhrer. I can remember making the decision to have testicles as one of the internal organs in the game and I think it was a very good decision, quite a gory one and uh, one that uh, is wincingly painful when you think about it. I'm sure if we do another one, Hitler will come back. We're stuck in the in this in this sort of bit of a Groundhog Day loop in that some people love us putting killing Hitler in there as a DLC and other people go, oh it's a bit boring, I've killed Hitler a lot. And I think if we didn't do kill Hitler, we'd have as many complaints as we do if we do kill Hitler. So we kind of we're stuck in this bind. We can't we can't get out of it. It's very likely that Hitler will get killed yet again in the next Sniper Elite that we do. I don't think we can escape from it. We're, we're trapped in this time loop. One of the principles behind Sniper Elite isn't actually to be gory. The gore is not the central theme. The central theme is take the shots you need to take to do the mission. Don't kill everybody unless you have to. Although some people, you can play it however you want. But that was one of the things we were always thinking about is, can you minimize the number of casualties and yet still achieve your objective? One of the things I'm very proud of in the Sniper Elite series is the this ability to tag and see information about 
the targets. We deliberately made some of them ambiguous, some of them clearly monstrous and you want to shoot them and others just want to go home or whatever it might be. And some people have told me they don't do that because they, they can't, they don't want to feel guilty killing somebody who's a goodie. And I respect that choice. That's the choice we made in the game. You don't have to get that information, but you can do. I'm quite proud of that mechanic. It's quite an adult games mechanic because it makes you think about what you're doing. You're a special operative. You're not a not a slaughterhouse. Your role is not to kill as many people as possible. Your role is to do the mission successfully with as little risk to yourself as possible and get out. I'm very proud of this level as well. It's heavily based on Mont Saint-Michel, a real place. This is our version of a sort of a holy island like that, partly based on the one offshore in, in, in north of England, Northumberland, but also based on the one of the French coast. And it was such a brilliant setting for a sniping game. And everybody went, yeah, it's going to take a lot of work, but it's got to be done. Right, the SREM. This is the result of Rebellion coming back to us after our work on Sniper Elite 4 and asking, and at the time they were thinking DLC, what have you got that's really wacky but just about plausible? That's the, that's the secret, isn't it, with a, with a game like this? <laughs> Jonathan, hello Jonathan. Royal Armours, I used to be a trustee of the Royal Armours, used to be on the board of directors for a while, so I know Jonathan very well. He's helped us out with Sniper Elite quite a lot with uh, references for games. And he's very helpful, he's a big fan. And uh, hello Jonathan, um, love your work by the way, really enjoy it. This is one of the very rare special weapons that uh, Jonathan helped us identify for putting into the Sniper Elite game. He's flung ideas at us and said, can you do this? And we've said, yeah, we can. We probably can't do it exactly the way it was. We can do this slight modification. And and he understands. He understands that in, in games, you sometimes need to modify, slightly change things to make it work for the game engine or for the gameplay. But yeah, it's wonderful for him to go, actually, Here's a, here's a gun, there's only one of these in the world. It's <laughs> brilliant. I love Sniper Elite because it means so much for the company, it's been so successful for us. And the accuracy of what we do, making it historically plausible, which is one of the words we use in-house. Historically plausible is what we aim for. Obviously, I'm super proud of um, the Sniper Elite series, and uh, if you've played it, thank you very much. And uh, hopefully we'll be doing more soon. So uh, Sniper Elite's really important to us. Long ships are the, the classic Viking trading and raiding vessel. They did both. They traded widely and they also raided. Usually 20 to 60 men. Um, most of the people would be rowers as well as uh, fighters, so it's sort of dual purpose. And sometimes the Vikings gathered together big crews. They gathered together fleets to go and raid things like London or Paris, and they did so quite successfully. Mast climbing, I have, I've got no idea whether, whether masts could be climbed like that. I do know that the boat would be going over. <laughs> would be on the ocean, so it sort of would be, would be tossing and turning a lot. And you climb up a thing like that, you're gonna to have to be really athletic to do it. Let's see what he does when he gets to the top. I have a suspicion he might do something spectacular. Let's see, I love games like this, where, where you take reality and you bend it and turn it up to 11, it's wonderful. This is brilliant, I love it. It's super entertaining. However, shooting a bow with your legs to get, with your feet together like that, with no stance at all, you will fall over. So I've, I've tried it. You will fall over because as the arrow leaves, you go backwards. So if you, you need to step backwards, you need a spread leg stance to use a bow. I, I have experimented shooting a, a, a bow from horseback and standing on Warlord. You can do it, but you typically fall off. But this is brilliant. This is this is a place where fantasy meets reality. They've kind of based it heavily on history, but they've had to go, they've wanted to go further because it's entertainment. We we all want to know about heroes and adventures and um, shooting a heavy bow, let alone, well, a light bow, let alone a heavy bow from standing atop a mast like that, I would say is possible, but you're gonna fall. And I guess you could fall in the ocean and swim, swim to shore. That's a big sword as well, and those are some enormously telegraphed swings. It does look good, but it's not how you fight because you've got to recover that sword. Heavy weapons have a lot of inertia, and just slowing them down will exhaust you. Real medieval weapons are actually surprisingly light. Your best defense against the Vikings was to run away with all your valley boys, run inland, because they wanted to raid, they wanted to get in there, grab stuff, and go away again places that were in remote areas that were meant to be retreats for the holy people um, were particularly vulnerable and the Vikings went well hey 
this is this is good. People who won't fight and lots of gold and silver. We can we can nick that quite easily. I'll just pause it there. Cutting somebody's head off with the strike of a sword. It seems to be such a common trope, even in the histories, even the um, people talk about it and talk about it. People's head head being cloven in two or chopped asunder. I guess it did happen. I have chopped against uh, ballistic targets myself. It's quite hard to cut a ballistic neck with a sword, with a single-handed sword. So maybe they were just very, very strong people and very good at their job. Or maybe they're exaggerating for effect, because don't forget propaganda has been around as long as people have been writing stories about themselves. But it, it looks spectacular and horrible. <laughs> The Napoleonic era is not necessarily an area of expertise for me. I, I find it fascinating because you've got the artillery, you've got the infantry, and you've got cavalry. So you've still got those three elements, and they interact like rocks, rock, paper, scissors. You know, each can outdo the other, but in combination, they can they can be okay. Blocks of infantry can defend against cavalry really, really well, but they're also a target, really good target for artillery. Uh, cavalry is really good against artillery because it can get there before the artillery can shoot them and uh, and do a lot of damage. So there was there was a lot of tactics in the Napoleonic era. The guns, though, fired very, very slowly. You you there were reloading drills. You know, getting three shots off in a minute was quite spectacular. Uh, and most of them were smoothbore as well. I fired smoothbore muskets and black powder muskets. And one of the shocking things is, A, there's a slight delay between pulling the trigger and the boom, going bang, because it's a fzz, bang. There's a definite half second delay as the powder burns down. But secondly, there's an enormous cloud of black powder in front of you, you can't see a thing. So a whole line of you like this, shooting over the ramparts, you're not going to be able to see anything after the first volley. <laughs> to be honest, I think I might shoot myself if the bagpipes are going on too long playing this game. I think sound effects are really important in games, but you've also got to remember they can become repetitive and annoying. <laughs> We've all played games where, you know, there's, a, there's a, uh, an, an AI going, who's that? Who's that? Who's that? Repetitively. It takes you out of the sense of immersion almost straight away. Interestingly, everybody's got fixed bayonets. There'll be kind of actual physical records of what you're supposed to do in this situation. It might be that they were told to fix bayonets, but those bayonets are quite long and they're really awkward. You'll see people spinning around and obviously in a computer game, the end of your bayonet can go through the, the model of somebody next to you without any inflict without any kind of impact, literally. In real life, you don't want to do that. You're going to take some of your friend's eyes out and that would best be avoided. You get into a lot of trouble doing that. <laughs> Cavalry action. And as he's doing here, he's using the speed of the horse to get in and get amongst the foot, and the foot are running away. The natural instinct, if somebody's on cavalry and your your broken infantry, is to run away, which of course means you can't see what's coming, which means, of course, somebody can ride up behind you and smack you really hard on the head or in the face with their saber as they gallop past. Cavalry were very good at decimating broken foot, and that's really what they were used for. They're a threat, as much a threat to the foot to stay together, then the foot get taken out by the artillery. Poor bloody infantry, as usual. Of particular fascination for me as a Napoleonic period is the, is the interaction between infantry, cavalry and artillery and the fact that they still had men in bright colours lining up, shooting muskets. You start digging holes in the ground and First World War comes along and everybody stands in trenches because that's the only place to be safe. And machine guns, guns that can fire super fast, mean that standing in a line with redcoats on is an old technique. It used to work, it doesn't anymore, the technology moves on, you've got to find a new way of fighting. There is no perfect solution to fighting a war. The enemy will find a counter to your attack. You've got to find a counter-counter. It's ongoing development and it always has been. A messenger. He was in a hurry. What's happened? Now this this must have happened because news travels at the speed of a galloping horse and uh, an army turns up you didn't know anything about it and it just turns up on your hillside and there's not a lot you can do about it chances are though as ordinary people you just let them in because you don't have any choice in the matter and there's a fair chance they take what they want leave you alive because at the end of the day the nobility needed the peasantry to grow their food and and work their land so if you killed all the peasants you actually lost all the value of your land because nobody could work it, it just became um, barren so they're doing the sensible thing here they're probably going to run away but i'm sure some of them are now going to try and fight against 
an organized army, which is death, basically. It's not, not worth doing. Put on this arm guard. Without it, you could flay your forearm with a bowstring, so be sure to wear it. Thank you, Captain. Oh, ain't exactly the weapon of choice of a knight, but it can come in very handy. Braces were used to protect the forearm. Um, I've used a bow, and if you get it wrong, it twangs along your forearm here, and it really hurts a lot. So you, you wear a bracer. Typically, they're, they're just protection for the inner arm, and some of them were made of bone. They don't cover the outer part of the arm, as you'd see in fantasy uh, movies, but they're typically just covering the inside part of the arm. It actually keeps the, the, the doublet, the fabric of your doublet, away from the bowstring too. Now, I would, I would take issue of the bow not being a weapon of a knight. It wasn't the main weapon of a knight, but all knights were expected to hunt. Uh, hunting was a big part of uh, knightly society. And hunting with the bow was, a, was definitely a thing, crossbow and a longbow. It was more of a hunting tool rather than a war weapon. We see it in the movies, you know, knock, draw, hold, 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 you can't. A strong, heavyweight bow you cannot hold for more than a few moments. Even, even really good archers, or even the, the best archers who you uh, practice for, for, for years, the heavy bows they use, they can't hold them, nor should they, because you don't want to put the energy into holding that string back. You want to put the energy into drawing the next string. Holding the arrow back, waiting for the uh, you know, command to loose, is nonsense. You knock, draw and loose at the same time. Sword fighting is difficult. There's a certain amount of instinctive behavior in it. One of the key things that people forget to do is move their feet, believe it or not. They tend to stand there and sort of sword swing, uh, and moving your feet is absolutely essential. Here, you've got a shield and a, and a sword, and he's got a two-handed sword, so he has an advantage in reach with his weapon, and he has an advantage in speed, because two hands on a long sword like this is faster than one hand and a shield. Some of those are interesting low strikes, so swinging from low to high is an interesting technique. And we, we do see in some of the um, burials, the mass burials after medieval battles, lots of injuries on the left-hand side and the leg, your left-hand leg, is going to be a target for a right-handed uh, swordsman all the time. Uh, it's just relatively easy to get and you can't protect it without moving your moving your leg away. I mean, Kingdom Come Deliverance is a, is, a, is a wonderful game where you get sort of immersed in the politics, the intrigue, the sort of what people did. Wars were fairly rare in the medieval period. They, they did exist and so did plagues, but the majority of the time was, was, was the normal social things that human beings do. Nice to see some of those things coming out in that game. Nice to see the perspective of, of being on horseback again, going through the woods. That's exactly what it looks like when you're riding a horse through the woods. One of my favorite games, this is the Bretonian faction. Obviously I identify with the Bretonians because of their, their mounted cavalry. You've got some really interesting horse armor. You've got chaffrons on the front there, full mail on the, on the chest. So, And you've got these fantasy creatures. Now, interestingly, if this was going to be real, the Pegasus, Pegasi, would need to have their own very specific saddlery built for the purposes of being flying creatures. They don't seem to drop things on people. I would have always felt that if you've got an aerial combat ability, the first thing you do before you land and have combat would be to drop stuff on the enemy. It might be that they don't consider dropping things is to be noble or knightly. It's a cowardly way of fighting. You can imagine them saying it's the sort of thing peasants would do and we're not going to stoop to that low status because the Bretonians are very stratified society. There were societies that fought ineffectively because of principles of behaviour that they had. Here comes the mounted charge. Interestingly, it's an oblique charge uh, and the foot are completely disordered and would be totally destroyed by real charge of real knights. They would just pass straight through that foot. The horses slow down much more slowly than they would in real life. I've ridden at modest speed towards formed foot at uh, Battle of Hastings reenactment with their permission, and a horse on its own trotting can knock five people down. A charge from 400 kilo flying creature with a lance behind it is going to have a lot of inertia. It's going to keep on going, let alone beasts like this. Uh, these are hippogriffs. They've got very heavy barding on as well, super heavy, possibly steel plate, possibly uh, boiled leather or something else, some other magical armor. That's going to deflect 
virtually all normal arrows and weapons. But look at how they're moving. They're moving like dogs or cats. That's going to be really awkward and surprisingly slow. There's a lot of plunging there. That's going to be super hard to couch a lance. One of the things with a cavalry charge is impact. And impact is determined by your speed and your mass. So couching a lance means the lance hits with greater impact than a lance held just in your hand. To my mind though, again, they are so heavy and so aggressive with beaks. They're carnivorous, so they'll probably be more than happy to chomp into the, the enemy. The combat will be much more ferocious. If these things really existed, the combat would be staggeringly violent. Think how dangerous a lion or a tiger is and then make it four times the size with a man on its back guiding it with a lance. That's unbelievably frightening and you think the damage they could do. Now here's an interesting one. <laughs> skeleton warriors on skeleton horses. I'm not gonna say how does the physics work because you need muscles to move a skeleton, but it's all magic, okay, so that's fine. They've got shields on, so they're obviously worried about um, missile combat. Generally speaking, missiles do soft tissue damage uh, unless they hit a bone and then they can break it, but bones are fairly tough. I can sort of almost believe zombies more than I can skeletons because at least zombies have got some sort of matter that moves their skeleton, where skeletons are just are just the, the framing, if you like, of a, of a human being. So, But it's magic and I'm not complaining, it's just an interesting conundrum. You see here, there is some kind of penetration of the lines by the cavalry, so they are knocking people aside. They, typically what happens is when you ride into somebody, you knock them, they spin and they fall down sideways rather than going backwards a long way. You would probably break through and then you'd reform. You go through the enemy lines, you keep going for 50 to 100 yards, turn around, reform and charge back again. That's what you really should do with cavalry. You shouldn't get bogged down in melee combat if you can possibly avoid it, especially not with tough blokes like this with two giant battle axes each. Use your speed, use your ability to reform and reorganize and charge again. And that would apply whether you're riding a griffin or a pegasus or an ordinary horse or a giant snake or whatever it might be. More wonderful flying mounts here. These are lizard men and uh, they've got some kind of pterodactyl, crocodilians, crocodiles, alligators, caimans, that kind of stuff, have very tough skin. They have a form of scales. They can be very, very weapon proof. Certain weapons would not go through them. Guns will, of course, and spears in the gaps and things, but they'd be very protective. So they're wearing a form of natural armor, which is quite exciting. Total War is one of those one of those games where you can pit, you can do a lot of what ifs, what if this, what if that, how do you do this, and that kind of stuff. And then combining um, elements of the real world in a fantasy setting and having having races with their own ways of fighting makes for a really compelling game. I very much enjoy it. it gives you an immense scope for gameplay for battles. You've got to adopt different tactics if you're against a different kind of enemy. If a game allows you to play the game the way you want to, that's a really good game. And if it encourages encourages you to do that, then it's an excellent game. A country ruined by war requires rebuilding. People are waiting for a roof over their heads, for jobs at factories, and for the end of starvation rations. I think this is a really interesting idea for a game, the sort of what happens afterwards. Some of the German cities were bombed flat. Dresden was a beautiful medieval town, utterly destroyed. The real rebuilding took decades. And in some places, things were never built, never rebuilt, just, just left as a space because it wasn't the money. Sadly, a lot of very beautiful buildings were destroyed by war and sometimes replaced with very ugly buildings, which is a great shame. But you don't have a choice sometimes. You've got to rebuild the city as quickly as possible and get economic activity going again. I presume there would be a process where experts would come in to check there wasn't an unexploded ordnance in this hole before you actually go about repairing it. Uh, I presume there's a process. I'm sure it's written down somewhere about what, what they do. There must be hundreds of unexploded bombs under the streets of London to this day. So this is a really interesting concept for a game, which is nice, nice to see. And this is interesting, using oxycetylene torches to break the object down into more manageable chunks. We always have a challenge on how to do fragmentation in games as well, because something like a brick wall will often break into lots and lots of bricks. There's a lot of physics involved, and the things we're always trying to do is make compromises to keep the frame rate high. So simulating all those bricks simultaneously would, would probably drop the frame rate to a point where you can't do it. So you end up with big chunks. And I think it's a reasonable compromise to, to keep the gameplay going. 
it's quite quite sweet so making it making a, a city garden or a mini park or whatever you might want to call it it's just beautifying it it's not it's nice to see things like this in games and it also I, I like games where you get to sort of make a landscape as well where you get to explore it and make it I've always liked the exploring side of games and this one looks really interesting I might have to play this I think it's quite a nice talking talking over gameplay components it's uh, it's quite fun to analyze it and work out what to say I always try to stay positive as well I I want to be critical but in a positive way because I understand why people have to make compromises they make. All of the games we've seen so far have, have been brilliant. They've got their own strengths and I can see some of the creative decisions and the gameplay decisions that have to be made to make them good and I can see all the hard work that's gone into into the background behind making them um, and uh, yeah congratulations to everybody involved. Uh, they're, they're all incredibly entertaining. We're very lucky to work in the games industry making making fun things like this. A big thanks to Jason for joining us in this video and thank you so much for watching. Remember to comment below for what other games you'd like to see on the show and be sure to subscribe for more content like this and beyond. Yeah.